Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery, Part 337, and we're cont continuing with our lesson titled Prototokus Advent. This will be Part 6. Now, <clears throat> what we want to do is to present as close as I can uh, from what I read in the scriptures the time, the events that are going to take place at the time of the return of the Lord with the Prototokus group to set up the kingdom. I uh, came across a scripture, the book of Psalms, that illustrates something very interesting in its uh, context. So with that in mind, we want to paint a picture here of uh, the conditions of that time. Turn to Revelation, the 19th chapter, verse 11 to 15. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 15. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now this sets the stage. The armies are departing from heaven to do battle against the Luciferians and free the creation from the Luciferian death grip and establish the conditions of the kingdom of God. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, verse 25 to 28. This gives us the background of the time which starts at the setting up of the kingdom and continues through the millennial state until the end of the secondary creation. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. Talking about the Father, which had put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things unto him, that God should may be all in all. Mm -hmm. So talking about a time, commencing, commencing with 
the departure from the heavens to the earth, the setting up of the kingdom, continuing until the time after the destruction of this current creation in which the Lord will turn over to the Father again all authority. Now turn to Daniel, second chapter. Verse 44 to 45. <clears throat> and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Verse 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. So, from the time that the Lord descends with the armies of heaven, to set up the kingdom to the time where the Lord turns over to the Father all authority, <coughs> things are going to take place. Activities are going to take place. And these activities are recorded <coughs> uh, <coughs> in an interesting symbolic way, in a literal way, in Psalms 95 verses 1 to 7, Psalms 45 verses 1 to 17. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read from the King James, although you can follow in the King James. I'm going to read from the Hebrew interlinear, which gives you a word for word comprehension of what's being said, because to me, the Hebrew interlinear is far more accurate and gives you a better idea of things taking place in a pluralistic background than the King James does. This involves the sun, its activities, the bride, her activities, and there's a scripture here which I find that I have to stand corrected on because I've been teaching something that's somewhat erroneous. I said that that worship would end at the time of glorification. It doesn't. The bride will worship the son, the, the, the bridegroom, but not in the way in which we consider that. that. Yeah. That's what I understood you to mean the first time around. Okay. Which is why I said what I said. <clears throat> okay. If you want to turn to Psalms 45, mm -hmm. you can follow it in the King James. I'm going to read it from the Hebrew interlinear. My heart overflows with a good matter. I'm speaking of my works to the King. The King, of course, is Christ. My tongue is the pen of a rapid writer. You are the fairest of the sons of men. He's talking about his comparison in glory to the rest of the Prototokos. He stands out. Grace has poured into your lips. On this account, God the Father has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, mighty one, with your glory and your majesty, and ride prosperously in majesty. <clears throat> so it's talking about <clears throat> when he comes down, <clears throat> the things that he's going to do <clears throat> in all situations set him off from everybody else because of his great glory 
and his being the Prototokos, the preeminent one out of the brethren, the king, the returning conqueror, and nothing can stand within his uh, uh, onslaught of devastating the Luciferian ranks. On the matter of truth <coughs> and meekness and right, your right hand <coughs> shall teach you fearful things. So basically what he's saying here is because of his divine characteristics, truth, meekness, and right, he is entering into experiences that are going to teach him greater things. This is a principle that everybody in the prototype is going to experience. The things that you do in the glorified state because of the glorified characteristic are going to set in motion things that are going to take you to a higher degree of understanding in the Father. This will be true from the Son all the way to the brethren. I'm going to read that again because this deals with what the Bible is talking about <coughs> the right hand. In this context the right hand goes beyond just a position. It is a condition. A state of being. A state of existence that brings forth things in the eternal state. Now yes. we're strictly talking about Revelation 1, 16 and 20. Mm -hmm. in, in, in that context, the, yes. right, the use of the right hand. Yes. I'm not talking about in any other way. There's no you know, YHVH right hand. No, no, right. no. no, no, okay, no, 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 no. Sure. This all deals with Elohim. Right. The Most High. When it talks about <clears throat> the preeminence of his right hand, mm -hmm. it's talking about more than just a position. Right. It's talking about a state of existence that elicits other states of existence that glorify the individual that's experiencing it. Does that same right, and I'm sure we're going to get into it, but does that same right hand uh, context refer also to Elohim being the right hand of the Father? Yes. Okay. Yes. He's the one that sets forth the, the, the principle. So I believe what, what I'm hearing from you, Mr. Jones, is that Christ is bestowing upon those that become his right hand favor. Uh, take it up a step. It's talking about the Father bestowing upon Christ the favor which will come down to the Prototokos. But this, this whole thing centers on him. When he comes, what his characteristic is, righteousness, peace, majesty, and it's talking about these are conditions that will go into giving his glory, making his glory a reality in the earth. What's coming to me right now is because we are getting closer to him. As a result of being closer to him, we're being purified. Yes, yes. Well, let's continue. I have one last question. Sir. Oh, sure. Since... <clears throat> the Son already has all things in His hand. When you say, this is the Father bestowing, present tense, mm -hmm. it's happening now. Yes. What is He gaining more that He didn't have before? Remember, the Father is consistently expanding. So whatever glory you have, the Father is bestowing more glory okay. because the Father is consistently expanding. Okay. He reaches the zenith in the heavens, but when he comes into the earth realm, he puts into operation things he didn't do in the heavens, and this is expanding him and the sons in a glorified state. So is he modifying a reality, or is he creating a new reality, or is this a some other experience? He's... He is restoring a reality that once exists, bringing the creation back to a state of function, and he's adding 
to it, his glory and his splendor, which didn't happen originally. Okay. So, should we understand then that the expansion is the addition? Yes. Hmm. Well, let's go on. <clears throat> it says, On the matter of truth and meekness and right, your right hand, which is a, also illustrated as a path, shall teach you wonderful things. Now, we want to get some illustrations of the right hand from a scriptural perspective. The right hand is the place where the blessings of the Father are revealed. Psalm 1611. You can turn over there. Psalm 1611. Brother Richards, did sure. you just read? Did you just read verse four? Verse four. Yes. Is that what you just read? Yes. In the King James. Uh, you're reading where you said the. You're reading the interlinear. interlinear. Yeah. Okay. In the King James. In the King James yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Where you said the right hand shall teach thee terrible things. You yes. said glorious things. He said yes, wonderful the word, things. The word translated terrible in the King James in the Hebrew is wonderful. You're looking at a translation from a Hebrew word. Oh, That's okay. why I'm not reading from the King James. I'm reading from the original Hebrew. So okay. it's talking about his right hand will teach him wonderful things, splendid things. Verse 11. Okay, thank Uh-huh. Psalm 16. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So it's talking about not a position, it's talking about a state of existence. If I go over to your right hand, I'm just on your right hand. I'm experiencing the same thing I'd experience on your left hand. Right. But with the Father, you're experiencing conditions uh, in addition to a position. Should we understand that when the Father um, tells the Lord to sit at my, uh, sit at my right hand until I make me run into your footstool? <coughs> Jesus, Jesus, Elohim, excuse me. <laughs> That's okay. Experiences, from what I'm understanding, an additional or enhanced condition at that point because the Father's master plan has you know, moved into this new area. He stepped into a, a reality. A reality. Called yes. the right hand of the Father. Huh. Fantastic. And what we're reading here, the reality is going to give you experiences because of the state of existence that you've entered into. Mm. So it's not just a place, it's a state of existence. Right, right. Well this now explains why Ephraimios is not just the father's Ephraimios, it's beyond human yes. you know, concept. Comprehension, yeah. yes. Now we see the scripture gives us Turn to um, Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, verse 2. Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, verse 2. That's right after Proverbs. wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. So this is not just referring to positions, it's referring to condition. If you're a wise man, your heart is going to be 
in a place in which you are gaining advantage, comprehension, understanding, blessings, the whole thing that exists when you step into that state of existence. Mm. In many parts of Africa and the Middle East, they insist that you only accept something with your right hand. You don't accept it with your hand. It's, it's interesting. But you can see the, the, where this, you know, the line, where this comes from, the connection. Yes. My friend, Bill Johnson, <laughs> he, he told me, he said, uh, he would have been left-handed, but his mom read the scripture, <laughs> tied his left hand to his side, and made sure he would never use it. So, yes. as he knows and has told us many times, this guy over here, he, mm -hmm. he's the one who told us, him. Mm -hmm. okay. There are some places that only wipe Yes, with their left hand. Okay. They don't wipe with their yeah, right hand. Well, yeah, that's about time you straighten that out. The right hand is to receive. <laughs> <laughs> the left hand is to get rid of. <laughs> yes. And, and nobody's curious, so... You, that's okay. You, you don't get into it. You dodged right. the bullet. Right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay. No thanks to me, but you know. So we see... We're going to continue. Um, all right, I'm going back to the Greek interlinear. Okay. But we're in Psalms. We're 45. in Psalms 45. Okay. So you should be in verse five. Okay. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The king he's referring to here is God the Father. It's talking about how he's laying low, wiping out the Luciferian opposition. People, uh, this is translated the nations, mm -hmm. fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. So what he's saying here is not just that he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. It's saying that he loves it more than anyone else who has ever walked the earth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> has set him in a unique position. On account of this, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. The word gladness there is joy, rejoicing, more than your fellows. Now why is it that he has loved righteousness and hated wickedness more than anyone else who's walked the earth? It's because he never fell. Because he was sinless. Nobody else born on the earth <coughs> has ever entered into the earth without the sin nature except the Lord. Because of that, his intense comprehension of what is good and what is evil has always been focused, even from a youth. Therefore, he's been on a higher level in the sight of the Father of righteousness than anybody else. That enabled him to give us his righteousness. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. Sure. Go ahead. I want to understand how that happened, Mr. Jones. He was born of a woman. Yeah. Okay. Yes. He did not have a... Because the sin nature is passed through the man, not the okay. woman. Okay, okay. All right. I will visit the iniquity of the fathers unto the sons, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The sin nature is passed from the man to the woman. Right, okay. Okay. That helps us. Okay, so it talks about he has the oil of gladness, the oil of rejoicing. In other words, it's saying he is going to be able to experience the fullness of life even beyond the other prototokis. More than your fellows. Your fellows is referring to his brethren. This is also quoted in the book of Hebrews, second chapter. The Lord will experience the joys of eternal life on a higher level than his brethren. Why? Because the Father has enabled this to happen because of the 
history of his son on earth. This is a reward that's attributed to him because of the sacrifice that he was willing to uh, um, pay in order to bring the human race out of the bondage of Satan and his brethren to the ability to qualify for the adoption. It goes on. <clears throat> All your garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of ivory palaces by which they make you glad. So it's talking about the, the garment, and it's more than one garment that he has, is glorious. And, and you perceive it, it's talking about not only is it glorious to the sight, it's glorious to the nasal passages. It smells mm -hmm. perfumey. It smells something that is just aromatic to the individual that's um, perceiving it. King's daughters. <coughs> um, who are King's daughters? Well, we have, in order to find out who the King's daughters are, we have to find out who the kings are. Turn to Revelation, the fifth chapter, verse 10. And have made us unto our God kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth, or reign over the earth. It's the <coughs> elders. The elders are not daughters. It doesn't say that. It says kings' daughters. daughters. Okay, so so the kings are the elders. elders. Who are the daughters? The people of the saints. No. Okay. They wouldn't be called kings' daughters. It's interesting. Tell me life forms created by the kings. The kings have the ability to create life forms. Remember these prototypes are descended to the earth to replenish the creation, uh, festoon it with beauty and grandeur and glory. These are the fruits of their creations. Remember Elohim creates male and female. Mm. This is referring to the female elements created by the king. So these thoughts went through my mind yeah. just last night about us creating life forms in our realms. Yes. And that's interesting how you're following it up with this lesson. Yes. So thank you. you're, you're a creator. When you become adopted, you're a son who has all the attributes of the father. What's the father? He's creator. What's the son? The prototype of son? He's creator. What are you? To be created. You couldn't be his brethren if you didn't have his attributes. Now they are, the inference is they are additions to the creation, which are not on the earth, they're in the heavens. Beautiful, glorious, um, breathtaking to behold. Now, are you referring to spiritual beings or physical beings? Spiritual. Kings are spiritual. Everything, everything created. It's eternal, has to be spiritual. And and the only thing that's re a re resident of the physical is on the earth. Okay. So, in a sense, in, in a similar concept, you could say that this is a YH3H uh, Genesis 2 7 mode. Take it to a higher level. Sure. Okay. If YH3H could create a race, right. what could Elohim do? Mm. What couldn't Elohim do? Mm. This is part of your inheritance. King's daughters, life forms brought into existence by his brethren, Revelation 5:10, and hath made us kings and priests. King's daughters are among your precious ones. The queen, which is a bride, stands at your right hand 
in gold of Arthur. So the queen here <coughs> is brought forth just before they leave heaven to set up the kingdom on earth. This is showing the panorama of activity that's taking place between the time of the kingdom being set up through the millennial period to the time of the end of the physical creation where he returns authority back to the Father. These are all instances that the writer is talking about that he's experienced through the Spirit. So, now we're in Psalms 45 verse 10. Mm -hmm. The Queen stands at your right hand in gold of Ophir. Okay. Now, what happens is this is taken to the end of this period. This is instruction to the queen, to the bride. Okay, that was my question. I wanted to make sure what was the relationship between daughters in verse 9 and daughters in verse 10, but they're not the same. Yeah. This is the father instructing the bride. Mm -hmm. At the time of the end of all things, before they're entering into, the fathers receive authority from the son. Just before the commencing of the eternal state instruction is given. What is this instruction? Listen, O daughter, the father speaks to the bride, and look and incline your ear and forget your people and your father's house. So the father is instructed, that's why I didn't do this in the King James because it gives you a different view. And the father is instructing the bride she has to shut down all memory of where she came from her earthly existence she has to <clears throat> totally obliterate all of that so that she can totally enter into the state of not having a beginning not having an end to be a total consort of the bridegroom but there's more. It says, forget your human past and your planetary origin. When, just when does that instruction begin? Where in time does, does the uh, bride, the daughter, start to forget her own house? At the time <coughs> that the father becomes all in all. The son gives the all authority back to the father. Mm -hmm. And the father gives instruction to the bride because they're about to enter into America, the America. eternal state. Oh, okay. So this is actually Great White Throne area. Yeah, beyond right. that. Right, okay. <coughs> so so before that time, in other words, when the current earth was still in existence, the bride, it wasn't relevant to the bride to forget anything at all. Right. Even though we see at the beginning of sorrows, or the beginning of the beginning of sorrows, the Adamic memory erasure instruction. Yes, how, is it that, how is it, because she's not on the earth, I guess. Yeah, and right. because you still have a physical. Right. So he's not going to tell you forget the physical, there's the physical right sure, there. Sure, sure. But now he's saying to forget that, it's gone, right. never to come back right. again. Forget you ever had anything to do with it, right. now you are an eternal consort to my son, you have no beginning, you have no ending, so he can fully engage gotcha. with you. Okay, no memory. <coughs> yes. <coughs> and the king, Christ, will desire your beauty. This is the last thing the queen is instructed to do to make her complete. For he is your Lord, and you shall worship him <coughs> when you forget your past. Mm -hmm. So the worship here is radically different from the worship of a created being to the Creator. It's the worship of the... the f Jesus talks about my, my Lord and my God. He worships the Father yes. in the sense of the Son worshiping the Father. The Bride worships the Bridegroom in that sense also. So you have this unique, distinct type of worship which transcends Anything hum on a human level could ever, you know, 
possibly because she's she's told to forget the human. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to totally function as God. So the type <coughs> of worship that the bride performs at that level, and the type of worship that the sons who are not the bride perform, what's the? Can you describe the difference between the two? Because they are different. Yes. Well, it's the same. You have a uh, <coughs> a circle. What is in this circle? You have the Father Supreme. You have the Son worshiping the Father, as the Son worships the, should worship the Father. You have the Bride worshiping the husband, as the Bride should worship the husband. You have the elders worshiping the elder brother and the Father, as it should be. So it's not the universal worship, like you would have here, where we all worship the Father. It's a hierarchy. Yes. You have specific worship, mm -hmm. which the Father expects from the Son, from the Bride, and from the Sons. This is what I learned from reading this. Yes. I'm picturing the Bride in the highest capacity possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are already operating in agape. Mm -hmm. See, okay. So now, the brothers that he's talking about that that don't get to that level, are they still operating in agape? Yes, but in a different capacity. They're operating agape as sons. The bride is operating in agape as the bride. Okay. So now, her <coughs> position. Is forevermore. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's eternal, yes. Yeah. Yes. She is a, a completely different entity, different type, me, different type of entity is what I should say. Yes. She couldn't be recognized as a son anymore for obvious reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Uniqueness yeah. of the bride, yes. Is she influenced by the Holy Spirit? No. She has the Spirit within her because remember the bride are saints. Who have the full, each saint has the fullness of the Spirit. But as a unit, she's functioning in the capacity of um, God. Is there oh, way I can? Yeah. yeah. And because we will know, as even as we are known, we have the fullness of the Spirit. So it's not like she leaves. She's just not used in the same capacity. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> she has her own unique position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody has a unique position these are these how the father has orchestrated this and, interacts with them, yeah. and it's clear from what you just said therefore that as we go down the hierarchy of glorified saints the Holy Spirit <coughs> excuse me even though they're merged I understand that the Holy Spirit has a greater and greater function that's a, perhaps a, a better way of saying it yes that makes sense right yes okay. yes Right. We're the new kids on the block, <laughs> so now something else has to happen because there's a change in atmosphere. There's a change in the reality. There's these beings, and uh, that is the righteous saints. Praise the Lord. I have an ending here. Scripture indicates <clears throat> at the time of the return of all authority to the Father, the bride will forget her past and be totally incorporated into the Godhead where she will reach the zenith of her attraction to the bridegroom and she shall worship him as a sign of her love yes. for yes. him. So everything reaches the fullness of what the Father designed in eternity <coughs> at this point. And uh, <clears throat> so what we find here, <clears throat> it's just a, a small perusal into <clears throat> the destiny of the Prototokos at the time of the reestablishment of the functioning of the creation. Yes. Everybody will have a place 
in <coughs> returning the creation to its degree of function <coughs> and then at the end of all things you have the culmination of everybody stepping into the fullness of their positions the brethren the bride the son all the authority given back to the father and then this this closes this era and then you enter into the era of the eternal the stage is all set yes and just so that I can have something to say and hear me say it the creation will for the first time be liberated from all Satan's influence and it can now begin its eternal existence in a non-hindered fashion. Well, at this point, <clears throat> at this point, the creation has already been liberated. It's gone out of cre out of existence now. You're stepping into the initial phase of the way things will be for eternity. Right. That's why the bride is told to forget the physical, forget her past. Mm -hmm because now she's stepping into a totally new era right. for which she's been prepared. So that, so that instruction, the forget to the bride, is really the first in the experience of the ages, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's the beginning of that yes. eternal life. <coughs> yeah. yeah, the age of spoken into existence mm -hmm. in Hebrews, first chapter. Uh, the, the, those that have qualified now will enter into that. Praise the Lord.